Humans are constantly seeking out mysteries to solve. We want to study the past to better understand the lives that they lived and the events that transpired so that we can better understand our place in human history or even our place in the universe. But not all mysteries are created equal. While some discoveries of ancient artifacts have completely reshaped our understanding of the people that lived thousands of years ago, others turned out to be nothing more than total red herrings. Today we're going to examine some of those mysteries that didn't quite pan out in the way that everybody expected. <laughs> So, in 1877, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli made an incredible discovery. While gazing at Mars through his telescope, he saw a series of lines on the surface of Mars between 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south latitude. He referred to these lines as canali, Italian for channels, which was mistranslated to canals in English. This seems like a minor thing, as many people view those words as synonyms, but there is a really important technical distinction. Canals generally only refer refer to man-made waterways, while channels refer to those that are naturally occurring. Other observers confirmed what Giovanni had seen, and speculation immediately began running rampant. Not only could these waterways make life possible on Mars, but if they really were canals, then it meant the lines astronomers were observing were in fact feats of engineering performed by an intelligent life form that was already living on the planet. It was a massive discovery, and one that fit with the widely acknowledged narrative at the time that life should be possible on Mars. Mars has almost the exact same tilt as Earth, meaning it would experience seasons in the same way that we do, and one Martian day is only 37 minutes longer than an Earth day. And because there were large areas on the surface of Mars that appeared much darker than the rest of the planet's surface, it was believed that those areas were oceans. If you look at a photo of Mars and think about how Earth looks from space, it's pretty reasonable conclusion to have drawn. However, astronomers at the time didn't have that option. Astrophotography was still relatively new and primitive, so there were no photographs of the surface of Mars. Instead, astronomers would have to stare at the planet through their telescopes for hours, waiting for the wind to die down so that they could draw what they saw. With no photographs to use as evidence, everybody basically just had to take the astronomer's word for it. But it wasn't just one crackpot making the claim. Numerous astronomers all confirmed the existence of canals on the surface of Mars. It should have been one of the most important discoveries that mankind ever made. So what happened? Now, well, you're hopefully aware of this already, but there are no oceans or canals on Mars. The problem was that the telescopes many astronomers were using back then still were kind of pieces of when these low-quality telescopes viewed a large number of pointed features at the same time, like the cratered surface of Mars, the details would be blurred together by the lenses to create the lines that Giovanni had observed. After a few short decades, what was once thought to be potentially definitive proof of life on Mars turned out to be nothing more than an optical illusion caused by low-quality instruments. Though there are numerous locations where sliding stones have been observed, none is more famous than Racetag Playa in Death Valley. The phenomenon was first recorded in 1915 by Joseph Crook, a prospector from Nevada who happened to visit the area. The sailing stones litter the smooth floor bed of the dry lake in Death Valley, with each stone leaving a trail in the dirt behind it to document its movement. These trails are often 100 meters long, and usually are either straight or slightly curved, but they can be more erratic, sometimes taking sharp 90-degree turns. There were no obvious signs of human or animal intervention, so people immediately became curious how these stones seemed to be moving themselves around. The sailing stones in Racetrack Playa weigh up to 320 kilograms, or 700 pounds each, so whatever was causing them to move had to be powerful. Most of the theories surrounding how the stones were able to move involved wind, hence their name, the Sailing Stones. There were some more complex theories involving powerful magnetic fields as well as some downright silly theories featuring aliens, but there weren't a lot of options available on how to research the movement of the stones. All anybody could do was patiently observe the rocks and wait for them to move. Early researchers would check on the rocks occasionally and mark their positions before time-lapse photography began to be employed. By the 2010s, the imaging equipment had been upgraded to GPS satellites, but for a full century, the method of identifying how the sailing stones moved was the same. Just stare at them and wait for something to happen. And in 2014, 
the mystery was finally solved. The sailing stones moved thanks to very specific weather conditions. There had to be a shallow layer of water in the dry lake, and the temperature at night had to drop low enough for the water to freeze into ice. Once the sun came back out, the ice would start to melt, creating large, thin panels of ice that floated atop the meltwater. These panels then had to be pressed against the rocks by light winds. Heavy winds would actually result in too much force and the ice would break, but light winds would allow the ice to continuously press against the rocks, slowly moving them. Though it was nice to finally solve the mystery of how the sailing stones moved, the discovery has little to no practical application given its reliance on precise and uncontrollable weather patterns. In 1889, the Smithsonian Mound Survey Project was excavating an undisturbed burial mound in eastern Tennessee. It was all part of a large series of excavations aimed at determining once and for all who constructed the many earthwork mounds that could be found across the eastern United States. There was already more than enough evidence that the mounds were built by Native Americans, but it remained controversial as many people of the day weren't satisfied with that answer. While excavating the burial mounds, John Emmett discovered a stone tablet with an inscription on it. The director of the project Cyrus Thomas declared unequivocally that the inscription was beyond question letters of the Cherokee alphabet. Thomas was an expert, and the stone was found on what had once been Cherokee land, so nobody thought to question it. That is, until Henriette Mertz and Corrie Ayub saw the picture of the stone in the 1960s. They realized that for nearly a century, everybody had been looking at the damn thing upside down. When rotated 180 degrees, the inscription seemed to be in ancient Semitic. This interpretation was confirmed by Cyrus Gordon, a scholar of ancient languages who believed it was Paleo-Hebrew, written in either the 1st or 2nd century. Not only did he identify the language, but he put forth that the inscription read, For the Judeans. Hebrew scholar Robert Stieglitz confirmed this translation. It was a huge development, as nobody had put forth a Cherokee translation of the characters before. It could have also been the first piece of evidence of the fringe pre-Columbian transoceanic contact theories. It was also pointed out that there was another problem with Thomas's assertion that the writings were clearly Cherokee. The Cherokee written language didn't exist until 1819, and the archaeological evidence made it clear that the mound they were excavating was much older than that. More fuel was thrown on the fire in 1988 when radiocarbon dating was performed on fragments of wood that were found near the stone since you can't carbon date a rock. The analysis showed that the wood was from somewhere between the 1st and 8th centuries, which would have fit the time frame for the Paleo-Hebrew inscription. And at this point, the writing has all but been confirmed as Paleo-Hebrew. But it still isn't good proof of pre-Columbian transoceanic contact. The stone has been ruled to be a hoax by the majority of researchers and archaeologists. It's unknown who created the fake artifact, but it's known how they did it. Robert Mainfort and Mary Quas were able to find the probable source of the inscription. The Back Creek inscription appears to be copied from the General History Cyclopedia and Dictionary of Freemasonry. While the book was written in English, the same Paleo-Hebrew inscription that appeared on the stone also appeared in the book, a book that would have been widely available at the time of the excavation. The historical record of the Shroud of Turin dates back to the mid-14th century. Though there are reports of a burial cloth being owned by Byzantine emperors before this, it is unclear whether it is the same shroud that appeared in Lyrie, France in the 1350s. Following the sack of Constantinople in 1204, the emperor's burial cloth disappeared. Some historians believe that the Shroud of Turin is that same cloth, but there's no clear historical evidence for this. And if it's the same cloth, there's even less evidence for how it wound up in the hands of a random French knight over a century later. The shroud, which is 4.4 meters, almost 14.5 feet long, depicts a double image of a crucified man believed by some to be Jesus Christ. The image, which shows both a front and back view of the man across the length of the cloth, appears to be both a photo negative and to show somewhat of an X-ray image of the body. When the French knight presented the shroud to the Church of Lyrie, it was immediately put on display as the burial shroud of Jesus. This brought the item a lot of attention, but upon receiving information about the shroud's alleged origin, Pope Clement VII declared that it was not the burial cloth of Jesus. Well, that could have been the end of the story. He allowed the church to continue to display it as long as it was acknowledged as a man-made icon and not a historic relic. This is still the official stance of the papacy, who make no claims of its authenticity. 
But even if the Pope wasn't willing to claim the Shroud of Turin was authentic, many other Christians were. There were simply too many mysteries surrounding the Shroud and how it could have been created. It was believed by many that the images were created by either the blood from Jesus' crucifixion wounds, some photographic effect involving ultraviolet solar rays, and a chemical contained in the cloth, or a combination of both of these. While there isn't a complete scientific consensus yet, a large number of tests have been performed on the cloth. There have been conflicting results, with some studies claiming its authenticity and others claiming that it was just created as a piece of art. The majority of studies refute the idea that it's the real deal, and some of them have evidence so seemingly straightforward that it seems almost impossible to ignore. First, radiocarbon dating was performed on the shroud, dating it to sometime in the 13th to 14th centuries, which is coincidentally the earliest date that the providence of the cloth can be traced back to. This would indicate that it had to be a medieval creation. The art itself also held a number of clues. The crucifixion wounds on the shroud do not match the wounds of historical victims of crucifixion that have been found. Jewish burial shrouds that would have been contemporary to Jesus have been found, and the cloth was not made of comparable material. But more importantly, a simple analysis showed that the body depicted on the shroud is just wrong. The arms are too long, while also being different lengths. The forehead is too small, and the posture would be impossible. The height of the person depicted on the shroud has also been measured as being between 5'7 and 6'2. Even 5'7 is already at the upper end of estimates for how tall Jesus could have been, and were he six foot or taller, the Gospels surely would have made frequent mention of his exceptional size. Ultimately, the most reasonable explanation is that the shroud was just a piece of Gothic art, and likely one that wasn't intended to be passed off as the real burial shroud of Jesus. The 1800s saw a huge spike in interest for pre-Columbian Mesoamerican artifacts. In the late 1800s, about a dozen crystal skulls appeared in public and private collections all around the world. These skulls were carved out of clear or milky white quartz, and according to the people who claimed to originally have found them, they dated back to ancient civilizations like the Aztecs, Mayans, and the Toltec. They claimed that the artifacts were thousands or even tens of thousands of years old, and that explorers had been captivated by the legend of the crystal skulls for centuries. There were a lot of mysteries surrounding these crystal skulls and their supposed magical powers. Some even speculated that their origins were magical in nature, as the tools available at the time they were supposedly created were unlikely to be able to carve such intricately detailed skulls. But of all the crystal skulls, none was more famous than the Mitchell Hedges skull. It was discovered in 1924 by Anna Mitchell Hedges, the adopted daughter of British adventurer and author F.A. Mitchell Hedges. Anna claimed to have found the skull buried under a collapsed altar inside a temple while accompanying her father on a dig in Lubantan in British Honduras, which is now Belize. Anna pushed the supernatural narrative, claiming that the skull had all sorts of magical properties up to and including curing cancer. It gave her visions of the JFK assassination, and she even claimed that she used the magical properties of the skull to kill a man. That could be a potentially dangerous claim to make, what with, you know, murder being illegal and all, but there was no evidence to back up any any of Anna's claims. But as it turns out, there was nothing either magical or Mesoamerican about the crystal skulls. It seems like a believable enough story, as skulls have had a major role in Mesoamerican art and folklore, but there were no stories from those people about the existence of crystal skulls or any supposed supernatural abilities that they would possess. Despite the initial claims, there was also no evidence that explorers had been searching for the skulls for centuries. They just kind of appeared out of nowhere one day and began being displayed in museums. Unsurprisingly, scientific analysis showed that the skulls were not created thousands of years ago. In fact, they might not have been created thousands of hours before they were initially sold to collectors. The earliest crystal skulls were created in Germany in the 1800s, most likely in the town of Ida Oberstein that was known for workshops that specialized in crafting imported Brazilian quartz. As for the Mitchell Hedges skull that was purportedly found at an archaeological dig site, that story was easily debunked as well. Her father made no mention of her discovery in any of his notes, nor did anybody else that was present on that trip. In fact, they didn't even mention Anna joining them on the trip to Lubantun. The skull she claimed to find was actually one that her father had simply purchased at a Sotheby's auction. 